Okay, so let's get going. Um, and welcome to this discussion about some re recent research about civil resistance uh, on the climate and ecological crisis. And uh, that's in the changing landscape of the post COVID-19 world. But before we launch into that discussion, uh, I'd just like to take a moment to pray. So, God of wisdom, we pray that you fill us with a thirst for your justice, with your care for the dispossessed, and with your compassion for the suffering. In the complexities of the issues before us, give us courageous and compassionate hearts. Give us wise minds and truthful words. Amen. Okay, so this is going to be a, a quick trot around um, the subject and it flows um, from the work I do that, to guide my own decision-making and what follows, it doesn't claim in any way to be comprehensive or expert. Uh, but I hope it'll be useful in the context of our principles and values. And you'll remember, if you've seen them on the website, that one of our principles and values is that we value reflecting and learning. And so if as a consequence of this, you come across other bits of research that you want to discuss, you can always put them in um, the CCA chat or just email us. We can run another session on this. So I'm going to begin with a little bit about the landscape that influenced much of what we were talking about back in 2018 when XR got going. And a lot of our theories of change were, and, and still are actually, based on the pre-COVID work of Erica Chenoweth, um, who worked uh, on some of these papers with a colleague called Maria Stefan. And back in 2008, they wrote uh, an article. They've also written books, and Erica Chenoweth's written a number of books, but it's easier in some ways to use the articles, and I can list them for you. Most of them are open access, so if you wanted to go back and read them for yourselves, you can. So they wrote an article called Why Civil Resistance Works, and their case studies and their data set, which was which was big, it's, it's stretched from about 1900 to around 2006, were suggesting that broad-based campaigns were more like the legitimacy of the opposition. And that's perhaps not very surprising because they pointed out the political costs of repressing one or two dozen activists uh, is not too difficult. They can be easily labeled as extremists but it's much more difficult to repress hundreds or thousands of activists who kind of represent the entire population. And then there was a more detailed uh, paper on why civil resistance works, the strategic logic of nonviolent conflict, which influenced a lot of us. Um, and at that time, there was a, a book that was written uh, that was in 2011, the books published by Columbia University Press. Um, and they found that campaigns of nonviolent resistance were more than twice as effective as their violent counterparts in achieving their stated goals. And they found that these campaigns attracted an impressive support from citizens and their activism took the form of protests and boycotts and civil disobedience and lots of other forms of nonviolent cooperation. And these efforts, helped to sort of separate regimes from the main sources of power. That's what they aimed to do, the sort of pillars that supported these regimes. And they produced some remarkable results in places like Iran and Burma, in the Philippines, and even in the Palestinian territories. Um, and they found that nonviolent resistance presented fewer obstacles to moral and physical involvement and commitment. And that meant higher levels of participation and that contributed to enhanced resilience and greater opportunities for tactical innovation and civic disruption. And that meant that there was sort of less incentive for a regime to maintain its status quo. Um, 
because there were lots of people involved in civic disruption. And that also had the effect of shifting loyalty amongst opponents who had previously been supporters, including, and really importantly, members of the military establishment. And they therefore concluded that nonviolent resistance ushers in more durable and internally peaceful democracies, which are likely to, less likely, in fact, to regress into sort of things like civil war. And um, at about the same time, Erica Chenoweth did a TEDx talk in which she talked about the uh, so-called 3.5% rule. This is the notion that no government can withstand a challenge of 3.5% of its population without either accommodating the movement or its, its demands or in extreme cases, actually disintegrating. And what she was saying was that a surprisingly small proportion of the population guarantees a successful campaign, just the 3.5%. And although that sounds, of course, like a really small number in absolute terms, it's really quite impressive number of people. And so that was sort of foundational to XR thinking, that sort of 3.5%. And even now, some of our campaigns are called 3.5, um, which re reflects back to that thinking. Um, and she asked us to imagine that number of people doing something like mass non-cooperation in a sustained way for, say, a year. And that was a very powerful thought. It's also, though, fair to say that in addition to writing and talking about why non-violent resistance has been so effective, she also that, that, that the evidence that she relied upon showed that it sometimes does fail. Um, and the other thing is that she focused, and I'll, I'll talk about this a, a bit more, on maximalist campaigns. These are campaigns that look for reg regime change. So they might not be completely applicable to a situation of a social justice movement or the climate justice movement. But in the, uh, around the same time, she gave an interview to the Harvard Gazette where she spoke about the key elements that were necessary for a successful nonviolent campaign. And those are still quite useful takeaways despite our changing landscape. And she identified four different things, I think, and they're, they're important uh, threads through what we're going to, to talk about uh, going on. And the first is a large and diverse participation that's sustained. So the second, is that a movement needs to elicit some loyalty shifts among elites. And in the context she was talking about, security forces are important because they were ultimately the agents of repression, are ultimately the agents of repression. And so their actions largely decide how violent the confrontation with the reaction to the nonviolent campaign is going to be in the end. But she also pointed out that there are other elites, sort of economic and business elites, the media. There are lots of different pillars that support the status quo. And if they can be disrupted or coerced into non-cooperation, then that can be quite a decisive. So the third thing that she identified was that campaigns need to be able to use a, and, and have a lot of variation in the methods that they use. And the fourth important thing she identified was that when campaigns are repressed, which is basically inevitable for those calling for major changes to power structures, that they don't descend into chaos. If campaigns allow the repression to throw the movement into disarray, or if they use it as a pretext to kind of move away from their nonviolent origins or to militarize their campaign, then they're essentially being co-opted into what the regime wants. It's for the resistors to, to play on the regime's playing field. And once you do that, then that increases the likelihood that you're going to get crushed. So those were the four things. Uh, and then Erica Chenoweth then wrote a number of books and papers in the early part of this decade. Uh, but I'm going to focus on her post-COVID paper, which was published uh, in July 2022. But before that, I just want to mention a November 2021 uh, paper, a monograph from the International Centre on Nonviolent Conflict. Uh, and that's quite a good resource, actually, because most of their 
stuff is is open to view. Um, and that paper was was titled Civil Resistance Against Climate Change, What, When, Who and How Effective. Um, I think it's also available in the, in the Commons uh, Library. So this is a, an Australian based study, but it's quite a big one. And there are a number of takeaways that, that are useful to us. And it looked like it looked at what it looked like uh, at, at the time, how it's changed, was achieving. And they found that diverse organizational structures can help to sustain increased climate activism. What, what that means is that the majority of groups, when they analyzed their tactics, used conventional methods, but um, the tactics utilized by a small minority of organizations uh, was, was different. And so, while civil resistance strategies and tactics are quite diverse, that kind of diverse uh, tactics that result from diverse organizational structures was important. It benefited the movement as a whole. And so it was important to include local groups that focused on sustainability and alternative systems like the Transition Town Initiative. And that it was a positive sign when they got involved. But they did diversity might have some downsides. It might hinder the development of a mass organization and it might hinder the use of civil disobedience that might be needed to force the rapid change needed to address climate change. So there's a bit of a balance to be had there. They also noted that climate change campaigns are achieving some su success, but the challenges remain really stark. And so their data indicated that campaigns were achieving higher levels of success than they expected, but uh, with partial meeting of their demands. So most of the campaigns targeted government entities, but they found that those that targeted businesses had the highest proportion of successful outcomes. Um, and some campaigns that targeted government were successful, but they were often targeting power holders who determine climate policy, the sort of critical stuff for driving responses to climate change, but they remain really pretty difficult to influence. So they also found that it, the tactics that were used by environmental, environmental groups were frequently nimble and quite powerful, but they were meeting a strong resistance of entrenched political and corporate power against these radical reductions of greenhouse gas emissions that, that um, we need. And that kind of indicated to them that there was a long fight ahead that remains in the fossil free transition. So they, 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 their next finding was that campaigns that in, against corporate entities that foster sort of tactical innovation increased success. So campaigns against multinational corporations are particularly complex and of length and duration, and they need to depend on a wide range of tactics. You can't keep doing the same thing. Um, and that was one of the factors that kind of influenced the success outcome. And in their final part, they, they made some recommendations for groups that were active in the climate movement space. And they recommended, firstly, building strong alliances between grassroots groups. This is a recurring theme through the research that, that I've been reading. They recommended targeting opponents and their allies using different and changing tactical approaches. And they recommended that um, activists ensure that campaigns and actions really clearly communicate the target and an achievable goal. So those were the factors that they felt were really important. And, and they also uh, made an invitation to external actors like the general public or um, sort of entities that were concerned about the climate, that there should be direct funding and support to organizations that are in the grassroots or that sustain local grassroots campaigns, which is an indication of how important they thought grassroots activism was.
Okay, on to Erica Chenoweth's July 22 paper. It was called Can Nonviolent Resistance Survive COVID-19? And it was published in the uh, Journal of Human Rights. And in that article, she looked at new descriptive data and presented it on the outcome of people-powered movements. And she suggested that despite their heightened popularity, these uh, campaigns are seeing their lowest success rates in more than a century. So that initial optimism that we were seeing at the beginning of the last decade has sort of moved away. But uh, she does also say that the application of her conclusions to climate activism uh, is limited. It's limited by the fact that her data set doesn't account for these non-maximalist goals like reform movements or justice claims, Black Lives Matter, for instance, or the farmers movement in India. And also um, sort of non-maximalist transnational campaigns uh, in relation to the climate movement. And she specifically notes this. But I think there are still some takeaways that we should have regard to in our campaigns. So she says that over the past two decades, the success, the success rates of people power campaigns have in fact been steadily declining. And she cites her previous papers in 2020, her research in 2020 and 2021. But since 2020 and 21, but, but in fact, she says that 2020 and 2021 were the worst years on record for people power since the 1930s. And she kind of has a little go at uh, trying to work out why that might be. And she describes the increasing restrictions on peaceful assembly and the fact that authoritarian regimes are, are, are more powerful. They have a broader toolkit of strategies that have become standardized over the past 15 years in response to this people power movement. And she suggests that globally, governments are adapting to people power with measures to deter, prevent, suppress mass movements and techniques. And that this involves a combination of divide and rule um, and uh, strategies of digital repression, uh, of propaganda and misinformation. So all those were important. She also said, that when she looked back at the sort of history of this, she said that after World War II, people powered movements were among the key drivers leading to sort of more democratic regimes, the global spread of democracy, and also the growth of human rights. And this was partly due to remarkable levels of public pressure that encouraged political and economic and security el elites to throw their support behind these reforms. And historically, mass nonviolent resistance, which typically involved the active participation of uh, groups like women, uh, as well as men, of children, as well as elders and poor and middle class people. So across the spectrum, urban and rural people, people with physical abilities and communities from all works of life, has actually been a fundamentally inclusive technique of political change, which is partly why it was more likely than armed revolution to lead to good things like democracy. And that's a really important point to draw out, that mass public support. Um, and to an extent we have it, but we're not seeing the same dividends from this, from our civil resistance campaigns as, as the 20th century. And one of the things she wonders about is whether Actually, this, this seems to have started before the onset of the pandemic. And so it's not just related to COVID-19. She thinks this might be connected to the retreat of what she describes as the post-war international order. But she also identifies another trend that we need to, to note, that the various tactics of people power, you know, sort of large-scale protests and sit-ins and nonviolent occupations, that sort of also public shaming and heckling, walkouts, other forms of non-cooperation have actually been commandeered by groups and individuals associated with conservative and far-right causes. So um, especially during the pandemic, they've been using this 
to build bases of supporters, to enhance their messaging, and to obtain some tactical and organizational experience and build their resilience for what is to come. So in a way, the language and rights and strategies of peaceful protest for what we think of as the common good are no longer necessarily fostering freedom and equality and respect for others. They've kind of been co-opted. And that was a, a bit of a surprise. And the third thing she says is that there's a real question about whether there are significant limits to the way that we use nonviolent resistance in a disinformation age. And she talks about how the technique of nonviolent struggle was in fact forged by thinkers and practitioners who, who had a theory that the primary power of nonviolent resistance emerged from the kind of irresistibility of the truth. And the fact is that truth becomes much more appealing in the face of state lies because the state lies can be exposed. But when those lies provide people with legitimacy and motivation, then they don't overcome corrupt power, they reinforce it. And she's thinking that maybe lockdowns and our reliance on social media for social connections exacerbated those information silos um, that were already in place. And they kind of divided an already polarized public into more um, sort of stratified views. And, I and this raises questions about how um, and whether we as practitioners of nonviolent resistance um, can expand our basis of support and our popular appeal if genuine understandings of the truth, in other words, people's honest understandings of the truth are fundamentally contested, depending on you know, people's partisan inclinations. And this kind of may go back to the session that Caroline did last week about how we talk to different demographics. Anyway, her conclusions and, and about the practical implications of all this are that, firstly, mass movements tend to win when they unsettle existing social relationships among those in power. When they gain allies, and when they develop staying power and organizational base to withstand crackdowns. And really importantly, when we think about what we do going forward, she thinks that this requires more, far more than street protests. She says that instead the work of people power will involve slow, painful coalition building, public education about the movement's claims, and then a plan to increase public pressure on people in positions of power and authority when the time is right. And that's really difficult when you face the urgency that we do. So we may be having to do all this all at once. Um, but she says that movements, social justice movements can share common goals of building power, expanding constituencies, transforming people power into institutional power. And there might be uh, a significant way that we can use that because we could use that even as our opponents are continually trying to demean and undermine and suppress us. And so that might be another thing to think about. Um, but she does say that, that there are protesters and counter protesters and they mirror these deep levels of polarization present throughout most societies. And that, you know, authoritarian movements are gaining ground and democratic movements across the world are struggling to expand their constituencies, partly because people have grown frustrated with systems of inequality and injustice that continue to sort of plague democratic countries and they don't see a way out. So we, we, we need to use um, our people power movements um, to, to build uh, demands also for human rights and democracy, not just for, for climate change. Um, and she pointed out that to do this, we'll need solidarity, we'll need skills, we'll need support, can't do it on our own. And there was an important uh, 
bit of research, I think, that I just want to point out. Um, it was about how social trust shapes civil resistance, and it was in an African context. Um, but it's relevant, I think, to all activists. And it suggested that there were several potential avenues for mobilizing individuals into nonviolent action. And it suggested that focus on, on high trust networks was important because mobilizing people requires our, our human and financial resources. We should invest those efforts uh, into drawing participants from existing trust networks. So groups that have already formed and that might include unions or civic organizations or you know, kind of student groups or importantly, religious communities. They keep being mentioned in this paper. And then we need to focus on fostering cultures of trust within our civil resistance campaigns. Uh, the study showed evidence that individuals with high trust, so that trusted other people are not only uh, good people, but they're good candidates for civil re resistance advocates. But mobilizing these sorts of activists is only the first step. Once members of a movement are mobilized, then civil resistance campaigns and, their, and the organizations that are within them should focus heavily on developing bonds of trust, not only emphasizing trusting one another, within that campaign, but also in connecting, building what the author calls connective tissues of trust to the rest of the country. Um, and evidence from other scholarship, other, other research has shown that trust can be fostered uh, in various ways, but some of them are you know, making clear, consistent accountability mechanisms for group decision-making that are transparent and that can be seen why you're doing things, and uh, as well as the fostering of continuous relationships between members of the group. So working on trust building exercises. Um, and building interpersonal trust is really important too, both between activists in the same movement and activists across different movements. It strengthens social linkages across campaigns. Um, so, and, and he suggests that increasing non-contentious interactions alongside contentious interactions, campaigns can actually generate that sort of rational element of trust and expe expectations also about the behavior of those within the campaign, but it can also broaden their moral community. So you might want to think about what sort of campaigns might do that and whether you get engaged in campaigns that are not entirely around the goals that we specifically have in just in order to build trust. So I've said that Chenoweth didn't include non-maximalist uh, data in, that, in those earlier papers that I uh, cited, but she was involved in a paper called uh, Who Protests, What Do They Protest and Why, which was written in uh, April, I think, of 2022, and, and, and I think she revised it in November 2022. And she examined uh, individuals' decisions to attend Black Lives Matter protests and also demonstrations calling for less stringent public health measures to combat COVID. And they found evidence that the protesters were diverse, but a representative part of the population. And they also found that the decision to protest was deliberate in the sense that it responded to uh, incentives, to, to, to reasons to go, and the importance, the salience of the issue at the time. So they also provided evidence that actually there was what, what could be called uh, movement overlap. People attending the Black Lives Matter protest showed a higher likelihood of attending other protests. And that's a bit counter to the typical narratives that characterize protest movements as sort of very separate. And it, it kind of feeds into that exile strategy of color, a wide range of movements that you wouldn't necessarily see together. Um, so that sort of um, 
that thread of diversity is continuing to run through this research. And she has also uh, cited uh, or, or recommended some, some work uh, by a group um, that wrote a paper called World Protests, a key study of protest issues in the 21st century. That's a bit more recent, February, 2023. Um, and actually that's a really detailed paper um, and worth reading some of it. It shows that protests for environmental and climate justice and uh, calling for action to redress climate change um, and protect the environment are increasing across the world and including in the UK. But it also showed that the profile of the demonstrators reveals not only traditional protesters like activists or NGOs or maybe trade unions, but actually, on the contrary, it, it showed a bringing together of middle classes of women, of students and youth, of pensioners, indigenous people, ethnic and racial groups, and lots of grassroots citizens who were actively protesting. And that was across the board in most countries. And those citizens didn't consider themselves to be activists. They were protesting because they were pretty disillusioned with official processes and political parties and the other usual political actors that are associated with, with them. So that might be an important strategy to build on, people's disillusionment with that. And I think you know, that's kind of reflected again in, in the direction that, that Extinction Rebellion are going in. The most frequent target for all these new protesters, the one that they favored protesting, in relation to by a wide margin across the board was their own national government. It, because they saw it as the legitimate policy-making institution that should be held responsible to citizens. And nearly 80% of all these protests demanded that governments take responsibility for economic, social and environmental policies. So they benefited all instead of a few. And then they looked at what protesters achieved. The research showed that about 42% of protests, and, 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 and that number is about steady in environmental protests, resulted in some kind of demonstrable achievement, a sort of partial success. But they pointed out that success is rarely the result of one protest event alone. And I think this is really important. It tended to be the result of many, either years or many protests focusing on the same grievance or demand. They also found that concrete demands have more chances of success than protests that aim at structural change. So the more structural the issue, you know, like uh, inequality or just climate change generally, and the more distant the opponents, you know, sort of the G20 or the financial sector as a whole, the lower the rates of achievements. So protests targeting governments, both national and local, targets uh, protesting, pro protests targeting religious authorities, protests targeting employers, and protests targeting local corporations had the highest rates of success. And they also identified this shift from an anti-authoritarian left-wing populist protest to authoritarian far-right populist protests across the world. Um, and that they've kind of adopted some of the same tropes and that messaging can be a bit confused because some of the traits of radical right pro uh, protests are condemnation of the political systems with allegations of corruptions and insinuations that dark forces are, are conspiring. So, you know, maybe we have to be careful to make some clear water. Um, one of the really difficult things they found, the most unsettling characteristic of these, this sort of way, pop, new populist wave, is not just uh, that it's a bit authoritarian and right wing, but in doing that, it's not just about people demanding their own rights, but they seek in that to deny the rights and equal status to groups they think threaten them, that threaten their jobs and their status, such as migrants. Um, and they also found that many national and foreign groups are, are fostering this animosity, weakening democracies, and weaponizing misinformation and disinformation in social media. So there's a suggestion that we have to be careful not to uh, play into that. Um, and there's a, their, their data analysis showed a really high correlation 
between the percentage of people who believe that governments serve only the few and the number of protests in the country. So the last report I want to look at is the Social Change Labs report on what makes a protest movement successful. And if you've not uh, come across the Social Change Lab, you should look at it. I think it's London-based, but certainly UK-based, and they do a lot of easily understandable research and often overview um, in social science and in this sort of area. And it can be useful in guiding the way you think about what you do about this. So um, they looked at various factors and claims with regard to nonviolent protests and civil resistance movements, and they uh, assessed the evidence. So the first one they looked at was that the claim that violent tactics negatively impact the chance of protest movement success. And they found that they could say that there was a high confidence in that being, being right. They also looked at the chance that a protest movement succeeds is actually heavily dependent on its political context. And they found that that was also high. And they found that there was a high confidence in the evidence that a larger number of people taking part in a protest movement is positively impacts the chances of success and is likely, in fact, to be one of the most important factors. So they also looked at the idea that an, a nonviolent radical flank is likely to increase the chances of success for an overall social movement relative to a movement with no radical flank or conversely a violent radical, radical flank. They found the, conv the confidence rating in that, the evidence to be low, but they think that maybe there isn't enough research, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, actually. I think that might be worth, um, they were, that might be worth revisiting. Interestingly, it also looked at protest movements that involve a diverse crowd of protesters being more likely to succeed. They found the uh, evidence for that low, but they identified that as the likelihood that there hasn't been enough research into it. So if you haven't had people researching something, then you won't find the evidence for it. Um, and the same thing happened when they looked at protests that have participants who demonstrate unity being more likely to succeed. We just don't know the answer to that. Uh, and protests that demonstrate committed protesters are more likely to succeed was very low. So, you know, that, 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 that um, is quite interesting, but the really interesting thing that they found is that the factors, they've concluded that the factors that influence the public are a bit different to the factors that influence policymakers. The public is much more concerned about the worthiness of protesters and, and our sort of um, kind of, whether we're good and trustworthy individuals and that sort of thing. But the policymakers are much more influenced by the number of protesters and the diversity of the groups that's, that are present. So that's kind of why the big one uh, didn't sort of seem to have much media impact. But we've heard that the government was, was a bit more worried about that, about the groups that came together for that, and that they really thought that actually it wouldn't succeed. The terms that we had set ourselves wouldn't work, but, you know. Um, and there's also um, evidence that protesters are more likely to achieve their aims if they highlight an issue about which the public is already on their side. And also if they attempt to influence legislators right at the beginning of the legislation process rather than towards the end. And if they focus on issues that have been recently covered in the media. So those were the three things that they thought influenced the sort of the political context. So, um, and they also believe, looking at the research, that the context in which you take an action might be important enough to dominate over all other factors, meaning that detrimental external conditions might lead to failure, regardless of how well you craft your strategies and tactics. And an example of that might mean that the current um, situation uh, resulting from the Ukraine war might might really be a big barrier in in how we how successful we are. <laughs>
Um, so that might sound a bit depressing, but I think actually there are lots and lots of good things that have come out of the um, the um, thread that I've gone through. Uh, let me just, before I, I summarise that, talk about radical action. So there's been a lot of debate about what can be described as radical action, sometimes as extreme action, and whether that's less persuasive, more persuasive, more polarising. And the honest truth is that there have been studies that have shown both. They've shown, there have been studies that have shown that um, people have uh, disengaged from the movement as a whole because they find action means that they just can't identify with the social movement as a whole. There have been um, studies that show the opposite and studies that show that actually it has very little influence. Um, uh, uh, the, the Social Change Lab has has done a review, I think within the last year, that suggested that it's likely that a nonviolent radical flank will increase in overall movements, likelihood of achieving policy wins. Um, but equally, uh, Stanford University, a, a study in, I think it was November 2022, which uh, was a small scale study and looked um, quite granularly into, into this with people and found that actually it, it, it might well undermine popular support, even though it offered certain benefits. So, you know, kind of, we need to hold that balance and possibly keep examining the research that's coming through on this. It's, it's a really new area. So I think that what I would say though, is, is in the context of CCA though, is that we're not necessarily governed by this research. It's useful, we need to think about it individually, but ultimately our faithfulness is to God and to where we see God calling us in this. So I think that the can guide us in that and it's a really important part of our discernment process. Um, you know, I think it's very easy to put ourselves, to, 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 to co-opt God's agenda to our own rather than to the other way around to be co-opted to God's agenda. So we do have to be guided by a lot of different things. And we keep saying we look at the science and I think, you know, maybe we look at the social science. So my roundup, why do we need everyone to be an activist? Well, there are th some threads, I think, that come through all that research. The first is that we need a broad and diverse group of people. The second is that we need a diverse range of organizations. And the third is that we need to build trust. And as Chenoweth puts it, we need solidarity skills and support. And to do that, we're going to need everyone in this, in this fight. So, I'm sorry that's taken a long time. Um, I was never planning that we would have breakout groups, but I do have a couple of quest questions that I'd like you to maybe go away and think about. Um, and the first, I think, that, 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 that we should think about is that which I touched upon a few moments ago. To what extent should social science research like this influence our strategy and tactics, both as individuals, so that might be a moral individual decision, but also as a movement going forward? Maybe that's, that's something we should have a feedback session on at some point. If you think so, you can just sort of say to us and we can organize that. The second question that might be useful to think about is how do we become this broad and diverse movement? And the third question might be, how do we build trust? How do we build trust in ourselves? And how do we build trust in the wider movement as a whole? 
Is that a matter of personal relationships? Is it, is it a matter of how we conduct ourselves in our actions? Is it a matter of what actions we do? So anyway, I'm going to leave you with these three um, questions to ponder. And I am going to switch off the recording and then... <laughs>